Welcome to Premise Podcast. This is your host, Angelo Sophocleus. In this episode, I host Dr. Philip Goff, an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Durham. We talk about panpsychism, the theory that consciousness is a fundamental feature of the physical world, and its implications for science and philosophy through the views of Bertrand Russell and Arthur Eddington. Further, we talk about the relation between panpsychism and evolution and make a distinction between qualitative and quantitative aspects of physical objects, discussing Philip's latest book, Galileo's Error. Welcome everyone to this episode of Premise Podcast. Today with me I have Dr. Philip Goff from the University of Durham. Philip, welcome to Premise Podcast. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Good to have you here. You are perhaps dealing with one of the most controversial topics in philosophy. Controversial not in the sense that it might be offensive, but that it's not a view that was widely held in the past by philosophers and it might have also been ridiculed by philosophers in the past, and that's panpsychism. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I think um, it, it's true that, I mean, actually, for a lot of the 20th century, any work on consciousness was treated with suspicion and it wasn't seen as serious science. I think maybe since the 1990s has been a, a big change in that regard. But but yeah, you're right, still, panpsychism was thought for much of the 20th century as absurd insofar as, as it was thought about at all. I think there's been... Um, it, the last five or ten years in academic philosophy, there's been a real um, resurgence of interest, and the view has gone from being thought of as ridiculous to being taken quite seriously in academic philosophy, largely, I think, due to uh, the rediscovery of some important work from the 1920s by Bertrand Russell and the scientist Arthur Eddington that, that we might might get on to talk about. So, yes, yeah, so I think there's been a real um, shift in shift in opinion on this topic. Although, of course, historically. Uh, the, the view has been taken very seriously throughout the history of Western philosophy and, of course, Eastern philosophy. So it's really, um, I guess, the 20th century, there's a sort of uh, suspicion of it, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is which still lingers to this day. Yeah, and you are one of the biggest supporters of panpsychism. I was uh, positively surprised recently to hear your name on uh, Sam Harris's podcast. Um, <laughs> when uh, he was talking with, with uh, Aneka Harris, his wife, uh-huh. about yeah. consciousness, yeah. and your name came up. So I'll let you define panpsychism so that I don't make any, any errors. I, I would define panpsychism as the view that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of, of the physical world. So on a standard interpretation of this, the most basic constituents of the physical world, perhaps electrons and quarks. We can think about particles for the sake of simplicity, although uh, we might not be working ultimately with a particle ontology. Um, So let's, thinking in terms of particle ontology, maybe electrons and quarks have unimaginably simple forms of experience and the very complex conscious experience of the human or animal brain are somehow derived from the, the the very simple consciousness of of of, of their most basic parts um, so it's a view sounds a bit wacky but um, you know I, I think what, what what it offers us is is a way of integrating consciousness into our scientific picture of the world and it does so in a way that that avoids the deep difficulties that face more conventional options of dualism on the one hand and materialism on the other and i think it's it's that fact that's making people think about it much more seriously the fact that it avoids these deep difficulties that 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 other theories of consciousness face so you might think in a way it's justified by a a kind of process of elimination i i, I sometimes say i would defend panpsychism the way churchill defended democracy so churchill famously said democracy is the worst system of government apart from all the others so I kind of think panpsychism is is the worst worst theory of consciousness, uh, <laughs> apart from all the others. You know, you think, oh, that's a terrible theory of consciousness, and then you start 
thinking about the problems of dualism, the problems of materialism, and then you think, oh, maybe panpsychism wasn't so bad after all. So, so that's so it, it. You know, it does have these unfortunate cultural connotations. People associate it with sort of new age ideas or so on. But um, you know. I think you should judge a view not by its cultural connotations, but by its explanatory power. Uh, uh, and as I say, what, what I think it offers us is, is a relatively problem-free way of fitting consciousness in. So that's the, that's the kind of motivation, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems that it emerges through our failure to explain consciousness in other terms. I see that there are three different, three different paths that we can take about with explaining consciousness, of course, there are many more, but the three main ones I see is that, um, of course, explaining, trying to explain the hard problem of consciousness, that is how we uh, come to be conscious and experience and have qualia as part of our experience. And when we deal with consciousness, we can either say that consciousness does not exist or when we're trying to give a reply to the hard problem of consciousness, then we need to find the point at which humans uh, gain consciousness. Uh, I mean, if we say that molecules don't have consciousness and humans do have consciousness, then we need to find the, the point at which, as organisms, we gain consciousness. And because of the fact that we don't want to say that consciousness doesn't exist, then it's extremely difficult to pinpoint somewhere in our evolutionary history to exactly when we became conscious creatures. Uh, I think that's where panpsychism comes in and, uh, in, and it kind of says, you know, consciousness was there all along. Yeah, I mean, that's, the, I guess that's what, one of the motivations that, you know, early in the history of Darwinism, thinkers like William James quickly picked up on the on the fact that panpsychism seems to fit a lot better with um with an evolutionary picture of of the universe you know if you one alternative is to think so, somewhere in in the chain of evolutionary history consciousness a miracle happens and sort of consciousness suddenly pops up from utterly non-conscious elements or the, the panpsychist alternative is that consciousness has always existed in incredibly simple forms and then natural selection over millions of years molds it into more complex forms. Um, I'm not sure that that's such a strong argument because, you know, that the, the materialist will say, well, conscious experiences are just complex uh, physical states. And so, you know, if, if we can make sense of evolution shaping these complex physical states, then that w we get consciousness in that way. I think the problem is is just the deep coherence issue, the deep difficulties facing materialism, and deep questions about whether it's ultimately a coherent view. Um, so I, th I mean, I think the core of the problem is that physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary, whereas consciousness is an essentially qualitative phenomenon, just in the sense that it involves qualities. If you think about the the blueness of a blue experience or the taste of coffee or the smell of mint. You can't capture these kind of qualities in the purely quantitative vocabulary of neuroscience, for example. Uh, and so as long as your theory of the brain, your description of the brain is couched in a purely quantitative vocabulary, you're always going to miss out these qualities. Uh, and thereby miss out an essential component of consciousness itself. So this is the worry, really. I just think materialism inevitably ends up effectively denying the reality of consciousness. Consciousness understood as the involving these qualities that characterize every second of waking life. Uh, the, the, the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science bars um, physical science from being able to give an adequate account of such qualities. So, yeah, so materialism w w would be great if it worked. Um, I don't think it would necessarily have a problem with these evolutionary concerns, but I, I just don't think it's a, it's a coherent view, at least, or put it slightly more carefully, a materialist view that accepts the existence of consciousness is not a coherent view, I don't think. Mm -hmm. 
So you would support that even the simplest forms of life or non-living things such as electrons have some mm -hmm. form of consciousness? Yeah, so that's the panpsychist view that, um, you know, human consciousness is incredibly complex and rich. The consciousness of horses, less so. Mice, less so again. And as you keep on going down, simpler and simpler forms of life, you know, maybe at some point the lights switch off and consciousness disappears. But the panpsychist claim is that, no, we just keep on having simpler and simpler forms of experience right down to the basic constituents of physical reality. So that's, I would say that's a coherent view, of course, that, that we have to ask what reasons there are to take it seriously. Um, but I mean, just a quick, couple of quick qualifications. It, it doesn't mean panpsychists don't necessarily think that literally everything is conscious, despite what the word panpsychism literally means, pan meaning everything is mind, psyche. But um, so the, the, the view is that the basic constituents of physical reality have some kind of incredibly simple experience. Um, and of course, human and animal brains do also. But a panpsychist needn't think that every random combination of particles forms a conscious entity. So they needn't think that tables or rocks or planets are conscious. Um, that's not necessarily part of the view. And also, it's it's important to emphasize that the view isn't that electrons are sort of having human-like thoughts, so they're not sitting there feeling existential angst or being bored or something. You know, that they're incredibly complex forms of experience that um, you need millions of years of natural selection to bring about. But the thought again will be that, you know, there's such simple experience that, you know, we can't even imagine really such simple forms of experience. But but I think it's it's at least coherent to suppose that experience does exist in such simple forms. And I think there are real theoretical motivations for taking seriously that idea. Yeah. Would it be a good analogy to say that, for example, the laptop in front of me, it's a certain combination of plastic, um, aluminum, electronic circuits that make up a laptop, but it's not that any combination of these uh, materials make up a laptop. Equally, uh, not any combination of molecules uh, make something conscious, that is the human brain, because we have rocks, which we don't want to say that are conscious. So is that is that yeah. a good analogy? And perhaps the panpsychist would, uh, should say, what is it about the combination that allows a human, um, an object such as a human brain to have consciousness and uh, a rock to not have consciousness? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's it, it's it's an it's a partly empirical question which entities, which composite entities are conscious. Um, that's not necessarily a purely philosophical question. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, so the, the panpsychist claim is a general theory is a general theory of how consciousness fits into reality, which involves the claim that the basic constituents of, of, of physical reality are conscious. But yeah, it, it needn't commit to all combinations of, of those elements are themselves conscious, as you quite rightly say. But then, yeah, I mean, ultimately, the desire is to explain the kind of consciousness we have pre-theoretical reason to accept, namely the consciousness of, of humans and animals. I mean, that, that's that's where we ultimately want to get to. And, um, you know, I mean, there are some challenges for the panpsychist as well in, in how you you bridge that gap. And maybe we could talk about that in, in, in a bit more detail between the consciousness at these basic levels and human or animal consciousness. Um, you know, n no theory of consciousness. It's early days in the science of consciousness. I think no theory of consciousness has all the details worked out. But it seems to me that the, the problems faced by panpsychist theories of consciousness look, look to be more tractable than those faced by uh, either dualist or materialist theories. So, so I would say it's, it looks to be a, uh, a more positive, a more promising, rather, research program. That's how I think of it. It's not a complete theory of consciousness. It's a more promising research program. Yeah. So... So the panpsychist would say that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of of existence, much as much like the being material is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we 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 almost see that as a 
tautology, of course, to exist, you must have some uh, to be made of some material. But perhaps there is something more which doesn't come uh, over and above the material, as the dualist would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, maybe it would be good at this point actually to to just spell out a little bit more the the kind of panpsychism that's currently being embraced. This 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 form mm -hmm. that's inspired by this work from the nineteen twenties of Russell and Eddington. So I'm inclined to think these yeah, you guys. Could tell more about what uh, yeah. Russell and Eddington did. Sure, thanks. Yeah, great, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, so you know, I'm inclined to think these guys did in the nineteen twenties for the science of consciousness what. Darwin did in the 19th century for the science of life, and I think it's a kind of tragedy of history that, that, that it was sort of forgotten about for various historical reasons, but there's recently been this rediscovery in academic philosophy, which has caused a lot of excitement and interest in a lot of publications, and, um, and so what, actually just what I'm trying to do in, in, in my, is so I've written an academic book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality, that brings together a lot of the wealth of recent academic literature on this. Um, but what I'm trying to do with my book aimed at a general audience, Galileo's Era, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness, which is coming out in November, is to try and get this idea out to a broader audience. Because it's it's getting catching on a lot in academic philosophy, but it's everything's so specialized these days and it's um, still pretty much unknown in the scientific community or amongst the general public. So that's what I'm really trying to get this idea out. Anyway, so let's get to what the, what, what their ideas were exactly. So... The starting point of Russell and Eddington, uh, Eddington being the, the first scientist to experimentally confirm general relativity after, after, the, after the First World War, incidentally. Um, so, so the starting point of Russell and Eddington is that physics tells you a lot less than you might think about the nature of physical reality. So in, in, in the public mind, physics is on its way to giving us this complete story of the nature of space and time and matter but actually what Russell and Eddington realized was that upon reflection it turns out that physical science is confined to telling us about the behavior of matter about what matter does so if you think about what physics tells us about an electron physics tells us you know electron has mass and charge these properties are characterized in physics in terms of behavior you know the Mass is characterized in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. Charge is characterized in terms of attraction and repulsion. This all concern the behavior of the electron, what it does. So physics has nothing to say about what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of the electron, how the electron is in and of itself, independent of its behavior. Um, so I sometimes make an analogy with a chess piece you know if you think about you you might be told what a chess piece does you know if it's a bishop it moves diagonally in every direction but you might also want to know what is what is the intrinsic nature of that chess piece what is it made of wood is it made of plastic similarly physics tells us what an electron does and that's incredibly useful information but you might want to know but what is the electron in and of itself and about this, physics has nothing to say. So this is sometimes called the problem of intrinsic natures. This idea that physics gives us rich information about the behavior of physical entities, but it doesn't tell us anything about their intrinsic nature. Um, so the genius of Russell and Eddington, their core insight was to bring together two problems that on the face of it have nothing to do with each other and to see that they could be given a unified solution. Uh, so on the one hand, the problem of consciousness, this difficulty of finding a place for consciousness in our scientific story. On the other hand, the problem of intrinsic natures, that there, there is this hole in our scientific theory of the world. So the unified solution is you put consciousness in the hole, right? You've got, you've got this, you're looking for a place for consciousness. You've got this hole. Why not put consciousness in the hole? So, so the, the, the resulting theory is a form of panpsychism. Um, there's just matter or just physical reality, you know, the kind of things physics talks about, particles, fields, maybe superstrings, nothing spiritual, nothing supernatural. But physical reality can be described, as it were, from two perspectives. So physical science describes its behavior, what it does, describes it, as it were, from the outside. But 
from the inside, its intrinsic nature is constituted of forms of consciousness. So this is a beautifully simple, elegant way of integrating consciousness into our scientific worldview. And in contrast to dualism, arguably, it's completely consistent by design with everything we know about the world scientifically. So this is, it's important to emphasize that this is a radically non-dualistic theory of reality. Um, but when you first hear about panpsychism, you sometimes think, well, there are the physical properties of the electron, mass, spin and charge, and also these consciousness properties. But that's not the view, this Russell Eddington panpsychism, at least. The view is physical properties like mass, spin and charge are themselves forms of consciousness. You know, physics tells us what they do, but in their intrinsic nature, they are forms of consciousness. And brain states, neuroscience tells us the behavior of brain states, the behavior of their constituents, but the, but the Russell Eddington Panpsychist says the intrinsic nature of brain states are forms of consciousness. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's, that's basically the view. It's a radically non-dualistic way of integrating consciousness into our scientific worldview. So that was a bit long-winded. Mm -hmm. Of course. But what is the initial motivation to explore the intrinsic uh -huh. um, experience of, uh, of an electron? How, why should there be more to an electron's value or behavior apart from what it does? What yeah. you said uh, previously in the beginning, uh, making the distinction about qualities and quantities. Why should there be a quality in, in the electron in the first yeah. place? Yeah, so um, so you're quite right. I mean, this is, this is a point that can be challenged. I'm, I mean, I'm here in Durham and many of my colleagues are prominent defenders, for example, the philosopher Stephen Mumford, um, of a view that's sometimes called causal structuralism or sometimes called dispositional essentialism. This view that um, there's nothing more to something than what it does. You know, once you know about the behavior of the electron, That's all there is to know about it. So why do we need to postulate these intrinsic natures? Why not just, you know, if science tells us, physical science tells us uh, just about the behavior of, of quarks and electrons, maybe that's all there is. Um, so I think the Russell Eddington panpsychist will say two things in response to this. Firstly, I, I, I think there are quite profound challenges to the coherence of dispositional essentialism. Um, this view that all there is to stuff is how it behaves. Uh, so there are challenges. There's a classic philosophical argument here going, going right back to Russell that tries to show that without intrinsic natures, everything ends up being defined in terms of everything else. And so we get in a kind of vicious circle. Um, I don't know how much you, you want to go into that argument. So that, that that's a kind yeah. of that mm -hmm. that's that's a kind of live argument there. Um, so we could maybe go go into. Um, so, so that's one thing. It's it's not at all clear that a, that a universe without intrinsic natures is um, intelligible. But secondly, um, and we can talk about that more if you like. But just to, just to mm -hmm. register briefly, the second point, you know, even if a world without intrinsic natures does turn out to be intelligible. Still, I think there's motivation to postulate intrinsic natures. Why? Well, in order to make use of, of this account of consciousness that I've been advocating. You know, we, we, need to, we know that consciousness is real. Nothing is more evident than the reality of our feelings and experiences. We have to fit it into our scientific worldview somehow. Uh, You know, if you've got a theory of reality that can account for all the data, observation and experiments, but can't account for the reality of consciousness, that theory can't be true because we know that consciousness exists. So we have to fit it in somehow. And as I've already tried to stress, the other options of dualism and physicalism or materialism, physicalism, and materialism might use kind of interchangeably, have just such deep difficulties That, um, that I think that's, that in itself is motivation for turning to this Russell Eddington panpsychism that does postulate intrinsic natures, but if that can give us a, a satisfying account of how consciousness fits into reality, then I think it's, it's worth making that postulation. Yeah. So, 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 but, so just to summarize, first point is not clear. It's, we can intelligibly do without intrinsic natures, 
but even if we can, it's worth postulating them to get to this very attractive theory of how consciousness fits into the world. Mm -hmm. And moving on into the more into consciousness a bit, evolutionary psychologists and evolutionary biologists sometimes ask, why did consciousness emerge? And they ask this question in the sense that um, at least theoretically, we could be doing most of the things we do without having an experience of doing them. Uh -huh. So one could say that consciousness does not have a real evolutionary value. And panpsychism, I'm thinking, could provide a reply to this. Um, it's not mm. that consciousness emerged out of our need to survive or create or it emerged somewhere in our evolutionary history, but it was always there. And I think it's true that we could be doing all the things we do without consciousness. But even if that's the case, consciousness yeah. could have always been there. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really interesting argument. Actually, I, I think I think maybe um, you, you mentioned Annika Harris earlier. I think may, maybe her, in her short book Conscious, she maybe puts forward a, a slightly similar argument to that. I mean, mm -hmm. actually, as testament to this resurgence of interest in um, in panpsychism, there are actually th three books going to be published this year with with, um, with pretty good publishers. Uh, so uh, Annika Harris's book. Uh, sorry, on the topic of panpsychism, I should say. Annika Harris's book, Conscious, that's already been published and has turned out to be a New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. uh, Christoph Koch, the STEAM neuroscientist, has a book coming out, I think with Harvard University Press? I can't remember now. Um, Defending Panpsychism and, and my book as well, Galileo's Error. Um, so, so that's just an incidental point. Um, yeah, so, so it's a good point, isn't it, that... Um, you know, there's a lot of philosophical discussion of zombies, these postulated imaginary creatures that are physically just like us, but have no conscious experience. So they, you stick a knife in them, they scream and run away, but they don't actually feel anything. Uh, or, you know, they're crossing the road, they'll sort of look carefully both ways, but they don't actually have any visual or auditory experiences. Um, there's lots of different purposes these creatures are put to but you know it seems like if we had evolved as zombies we would have behaved just the same uh so we would have survived just the same and so that does make it somewhat mysterious what what the evolutionary purpose of consciousness is whereas as you say this this is not a not a problem for the panpsychist because um, consciousness is just it's just a basic feature of physical reality so in that sense of course evolved creatures are going to be conscious just as they're going to be material uh, you know for the panpsychist in fact that they, they amount to pretty much the same thing um, I can having said that I can imagine a materialist challenging this argument saying um, they might challenge the the coherence or the possibility of zombies or they might say well, you know, consciousness just is a matter of complex behavior. So, so of, so of course, the, these two things can't really come apart. So, so you know, there are lots of diff difficult, to, different debates here. And, um, you, you, you know, there, it's a big challenge. But, yeah, I, I certainly think it. panpsychism can feel crazy when you first start thinking about it. But what, once you've seen the theoretical attractions and you're sort of in the mindset, it actually is pretty consonant with a lot of our contemporary scientific picture of the world. There's nothing essentially supernatural or spiritual about it. It really is a view, as many early early Darwinians realized, it is a view that's consonant with a with a very naturalistic scientific worldview. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned the zombie argument there, um, I think the panpsychist would need to refute the zombie argument because if consciousness is a fundamental aspect of existence then perhaps there couldn't be yeah. zombies that that creatures that behave like humans but do not experience um, it seems that in the panpsychic behavior and conscious experience go together yeah that's a really good point i think i think what you say is correct although there's a slightly difficult terminological issue here of how we define physical or physical properties 
Mm. And this arises because as on this Russell Eddington panpsychist view, um, it's become known in, in the philosophy literature as Russellian monism. Actually, and actually it does come in panpsychist and non-panpsychist forms. I just throw that in for uh, mm -hmm. philosophy listeners who might want to make connections. Um, but to come back to the point, um, in this Russell Eddington panpsychist view, we distinguish between the behavioral or dispositional properties of matter that physical science describes and the intrinsic nature of matter. And these are not two distinct kinds of property, really. You know, the, the Russell Eddington panpsychist would say, you know, there's just one property mass, but we can describe what it does. That's what physical science does. Or we can describe its intrinsic nature. Nonetheless, we can distinguish these two aspects. So then when we when we think about zombies and we say, is a zombie conceivable? Is a zombie possible? We've got to ask, well, are, are we thinking of a zombie? So a zombie is, by definition, has all the same physical properties as us. But do we mean it has all the same behavioral properties and its parts behave in all the same ways, the kind of properties physical science describes? Or do we mean it's identical to us in terms of its intrinsic nature? So the panpsychist is going to say, and, and then we get kind of two different kinds of zombie in a way. So panpsychist will say, there is a possible creature that is identical to a human being in all the respects physical science can discern in the sense that it behaves the same and all its parts behave the same. But there's, there, there's no, we couldn't have a zombie whose intrinsic nature was the same of the intrinsic nature of a human being because on the panpsychist view, the intrinsic nature of matter just is constituted of forms of consciousness. So that would be saying, you know, you could have consciousness without consciousness. So yeah, so 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 you can have zomb so it depends how you're defining zombie. You can have a zombie if we're thinking of zombies in terms of this the intrinsic nature of matter, then the panpsychist will say they're impossible. But if we're thinking of zombies in terms of the uh, dispositional properties of matter, then they will say that zombies are possible. So yeah, so it's a it's an interesting sort of nuanced take on, on the kind of zombie. Um do you, I want to ask, do you see consciousness as a, um, as a fixed concept or um, as something that comes in degrees? Um, you mentioned previously that humans have some form of consciousness, uh, horses have some, um, I'm not sure if I can say lower form of consciousness. So would you think that consciousness comes in, in degrees? And perhaps when we say consciousness, we mean um that there is something like being that organism, that there's something yeah. like being a human or there's something like being a horse or there's something like being an electron. Yeah. Um, do you think that something likeness comes in degrees? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I think there are different views on this. And you know, I mean, as you say, consciousness is a little bit of an ambiguous word. People use it to mean different things. The way I use it, keeping with 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 how you just define the term is using Thomas Nagel's term um what it's like to be so Th Nagel said something's conscious just in case there's something that it's like to be it so there's something that it's like to be a horse to be a rabbit to be a mouse there's something that it's like from the inside as it were but there's arguably nothing that it's like to be a table for example so 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 that's the kind of notion and yeah so I'm I'm inclined to think that that notion does not come in degrees um, for any given thing. Either there's something that it's like to be it or there isn't. Either something has experience or it doesn't. So I sort of think of that as, a, as an on-off thing. When people talk about degrees, as you just did, I think maybe they're talking about something slightly different. You know, maybe the complexity of consciousness or intelligence or self-awareness you can imagine that coming in gradations you know in in degrees one becoming more aware of oneself uh, more aware yeah. of things as one what wakes you, up what you said previously about an electron not having existential angst um, yeah. perhaps our experience of consciousness is far more rich but yeah i, I think i agree that either you're conscious or you're not yeah I, either you, and it could be that people talk in cross purposes in this regard a little bit 
because maybe they're defining consciousness in different ways. So yeah, so complexity of consciousness comes in degrees. Awareness or self-awareness of the external world or self-awareness can come in degrees as you get rap as you get progressively drunk, your awareness of the external world decreases. Um, but I think basic the fact of experience, whether something has experience or not, seems to me an all or nothing matter. Mm -hmm. And do you think the concept of something likeness is always synonymous to consciousness? Uh, perhaps we're getting into other uh, areas of philosophy here, but there is something like being the president of the United States, or there is something like being the brother of someone, or there is something like being from a particular country, and that's not tied to consciousness. I'm just yeah. having some random thoughts here, but yeah, um, uh, yeah. When I, what, what do you think about something likeness? That's perhaps the quality of experience and consciousness itself. Yeah, no, no. There are some difficult, thorny issues here. Um, so you know, some people have tried. I, I think, mo I would, I would say most people on all sides of this debate are happy with defining consciousness with reference to this Nagel term. But mm -hmm. some people are, are, have tried to reject it. Uh, Paul Snowden's written interesting stuff, and um, uh, Peter Hacker has a paper, I think, called Is There Anything That It's Like To Be A Bat or something, uh, where they try to say, oh, look, they, they, they point to different, kind of similar to what you've just done, they, they, they point to different uses of this term that have nothing to do with consciousness and Uh, and, and they say, really, there, there isn't really a coherent way of picking out consciousness with this term. I mean, I, I would say, yes, you can use this language in different ways. There's a comparative notion of what it's like when, when you're comparing two things that's not necessarily the Nagel sense of what it's like. Um, so, yes, there are other uses of this terminology. And for some people, it might not be helpful. You know, some people it's helpful to get onto the notion. Basic, but basically, I, you know, I would say there is a basic notion here of subjective experience that what, for the 13 years or so I've taught academic philosophy, you know, you, you, you start talking to first year undergraduates about this. They get onto it straight away. I, I've never found any difficulty people getting onto the I, this basic idea of subjective experience, you know, mm -hmm. just with some examples. I sort of suspect that it's uh, it, it only seems to be sophisticated philosophers who 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 have difficulty with it. I, I think maybe because <laughs> they that they, they would like to. But I, so I think there's a basic idea here that's that's very easy to get on. Of, of course, you know, I'm not I'm not meaning to reject too quickly the challenges from Hacker and Snowden. You know, it could be that these first year undergraduates latch onto it very easily, but that's because they're very easily corrupt by philosophy and um, you know getting lost in conceptual confusion but yeah I, you know my starting point is there's a quite clear notion here that you can easily get onto with some it, it, I think it's a primitive notion um, I don't think that's necessarily a problem there are lots of primitive notion of having subjective experience having an inner life if you like that a lot of people find it intuitive to get onto with this Nagel talk but that's not necessarily the only route and um, You, you know, some people find it just easier just to talk about experience rather than this funny phrase, what it's like to be. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, before closing, I would like to talk to you about uh, your book, um, Carlea's Error. Is that basically based on the distinction you made previously between quantitative and qualitative properties? And It's a sort of criticism towards scientists like Galileo who put too much emphasis on uh, explaining the world through um, the quantitative properties of the world and leaving qualitative properties outside. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So yeah, exactly. It, it traces back the problem of consciousness to the, the start of the scientific revolution and thinks about it in these terms of qualities and quantities. So I mean, so a key moment in the scientific revolution is Galileo's decision that mathematics is to be the language of the new science, right? Uh, the new science is to have a purely quantitative vocabulary. So this is a much discussed moment. What's less focused on is the philosophical work Galileo had to do to get there. You know, so before Galileo, people thought the world, the world, the physical world was filled with qualities. You know, Aristotle thought 
you know, the, the quality, colors on the surfaces of objects, smells floating through the air, tastes actually inside food. And, um, and this was a challenge for Galileo because it, it's hard to see, as we've been discussing, how you can capture these qualities in a purely quantitative vocabulary. How can you capture in an equation, you know, the redness of a red experience? So this was a challenge for Galileo's aspiration to exhaustively describe physical reality in mathematics. So Galileo got around this by proposing a radically new philosophical theory of reality. And according to this view, the qualities are not really out there in physical reality. Rather, they're in the consciousness of the observer, which Galileo took to be outside of the, uh, the domain of science. Um, so the, the redness of the tomato, it's not really on the surface of the tomato. It's in the consciousness of the person perceiving a tomato or the, uh, the, the, the spiciness of the paprika. It's not really in the paprika. It's in the consciousness of the person eating it. Um, so in Galileo's worldview, there's this radical division, this radical dualism between the physical world with its purely quantitative properties that can be captured in mathematical geometry and consciousness with its qualities that's outside the domain of science, right? So Galileo strips the physical world of its qualities so that after he's done that, all that remains are the, are the purely quantitative features of the physical world. So we've got the physical world with its quantitative features, which is the domain of science. And we've got consciousness with its qualities, which is outside the domain of science. So this is the start of mathematical physics, which has gone really well. But, you know, it's crucial to realize that Galileo only intended physical science to be a partial description of reality. The, the whole project was premised on taking consciousness outside of the domain of science. So this is absolutely important to me because I think although the problem of consciousness is, is taken quite seriously these days, which was not always the case, a lot of people still think, oh, we just need to do more neuroscience in McCracket. And the reason they think that is because you know, they say, well, you know, look at the great success of physical science and explaining more and more of our universe. Of course, one day it's going to crack the problem of consciousness. But the irony is physical science has done so well precisely because it, it, it was designed to exclude consciousness. Right. It's never been in the business of um, of explaining the subjective qualities of experience. It's been in the business of giving mathematical models to predict the behavior of matter. So I think, you know, if Galileo were to time travel to the present day and be told, um, you know, there's this problem of explaining consciousness in physical science terms, he'd say, of course you can't do that. I designed physical science to deal with quantities, not qualities. And the fact that it's done incredibly well dealing with quantities and mathematical models of that predict the behavior of matter gives you absolutely no reason to to think that it would be good at dealing with qualities. Um, so yeah, although, you know, the book's provocatively called Galileo's Error, you know, in many ways, I'm very sympathetic to Galileo. And I think he w was completely clear that physical science alone as a purely mathematical quantitative science is it's just not in the business of dealing with consciousness. That's not what it's designed for. That's never been what it's had any success with. So this is really the line I'm, I'm trying to push. And um, you know, I, th I think I, I deal a lot with fiddly arguments and I deal with fiddly arguments in the book. But I think it's at the end of the day, it's the big picture narrative that persuades people. I think people still stick with materialism because they think this idea of look at the success of physical science. So what I'm trying to push is physical science has been wonderful. It's absolutely crucial. It's crucial. It's a crucial part of a theory of consciousness. But it was it was never in the business of dealing with with consciousness itself entirely. The whole project was premised on setting consciousness outside of the um, the domain of science. And if we really want a science of consciousness, we need to find a way of bringing it back in. We need to find a way of bringing the qualitative and the quantitative back together. And it looks to me that this Russell Eddington panpsychism is the best way forward for doing that. So, so that's that's the that's mm -hmm. the big picture of the book. But it's also it's also a, a, an attempt to give an incredibly accessible introduction to the problem of consciousness and the materialist solution. 
the arguments there, the dualist solution, the arguments there. And also finally to, to reflect on you know, the implications of this view for human existence and um, the lived life we all lead. So yeah, so that that's that's basically the, the idea of the book. Mm -hmm. Given what you said, I'm extremely interested in hearing your reply to the question, if a tree falls in the forest and there is no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? I, uh, I discussed this a few weeks ago with another lecture from the philosophy department in Durham, Dr. Richard uh, yeah. Richards. Uh, yeah. um, and this question seems to raise the distinction between uh, on one one hand, the quantitative properties of the tree falling and producing some uh, vibrations in in the air, and on the other hand, the qualitative experience of hearing sound. Um, so, what would be your reply in this in, the, in this question? How would you approach it? Yeah, excellent. Actually, my my publisher, my US publisher, is is at this moment putting together a little animation. I asked them. You know, do you think we could put together a little animation to help publicize the book? And they had to think about it, and they they actually latched on to. The, I mean, I discussed this issue in relation to Galileo in the first chapter of my book, and they thought, oh, that's a great kind of starting point for an animation. You know, if a tree uh -huh. if a tree falls in a forest, doesn't make. Um, I think I might be afraid. Afraid I might give a somewhat philosopher's answer to this and say, you know, it, it depends what we mean by color <laughs> it depends it depends what we mean yeah. by sound sorry in, in the case of the tree it depends what we mean by sound there's a nice really nice paper by david chalmers um perception and the fall from eden i think where he distinguishes di different kinds of color concepts um so you know i mean i think we can we can use the word the words you know color terms and sound terms especially now you know given our modern scientific picture of the world, we, you know, we can use those terms to refer to physical properties out there in the world. You know, we can use this word sound to refer to um, vibrations. We can use the word heat to refer to molecular motion, color to refer to wavelength properties or properties of surfaces connected to wavelength. So I think that's a legitimate way to do it. And, th and then you get one answer that the tree does make a sound, uh, it's maybe not our most natural way of using color terms. I think it's more natural, what's sometimes called the naive realist uh, theory of color, that you know the, the the color qualities are really out there on the surfaces of objects. Um, I'm inclined to think that 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 view is is just false. But I mean, so I guess what I'm interested in is what about the qualities, the the redness of the red experience, the the sound qualities that we encounter in direct experience and i guess if we focus on those I, I i think i'd follow galileo and think that they're really in conscious experience they're not really out there in the world they seem to us to be out there in the world we sort of project our experience onto the world uh, and the naive realist takes that view of face value but i i, mean, I think there are good sort of philosophical stroke scientific reasons to doubt naive realism so yeah, so if we're just focused on the qualitative properties, I probably agree with Peter and Galileo that they're really just in consciousness. But I think, you know, this is just a terminological issue here that we could choose. Maybe it's partly revising our terms. We might think it's more useful to revise these terms so that they refer to features of the physical world rather than these qualities that we encounter and experience. Mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. always disappointing to give a terminological answer but <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah there you go yeah great so are you focusing anywhere specifically now regarding your research are you preparing any uh any book um lots of different things lots of different things i'm writing a paper on fine tuning in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics with al wilson from the university of birmingham um, I'm writing a paper on panpsychism with uh, Luke Roloffs from the University of Bochum. Um, I'm, I'm also thinking about this, there's going to be a volume on um, quantum mechanics and consciousness coming out with Oxy Oxford University Press. And um, I was invited to contribute something to that. So I've been thinking about wave function monism, which is the view that some people think is the uh, many philosophers of physics think is, is is the most is the best interpretation of the ontology of quantum mechanics 
which is just that the only thing that exists fundamentally is is the wave function, which is taken to be a complex valued field over very, very high dimensional space. So the number of dimensions um, for every particle in the universe, if you take the number of particles in the universe and times that by three, then you get the number of dimensions in this space that uh, that, that these people think is fundamental reality is made up of this very, very, very high dimensional space. Mm. Um, so I've been thinking about whether whether the, whether this kind of view can make sense of consciousness, of the reality of consciousness, and looking at the challenges of accounting for the reality of consciousness if you have this kind of view. And I think um, I think there are deep challenges, and that might give us reason to doubt that view. You know, this is part of what I, what I'm trying to push is that um, philosophers underexploit the resource of consciousness. This consciousness is something we know for certain to exist, and yet its implications for our overall theory of reality are hard, are much neglected in science or even in philosophy. So I think you know this could be a case where reflection on on the ontological implications of the reality of consciousness might help break the dreadlock a little bit in in how to understand the ontology of quantum mechanics. That's what I'm exploring. But um, yeah, I, I think there's just something very exciting going on more generally with panpsychism, that there's a lot of philosophers getting in labs. You know, there's uh, Hedda Hassel Merck from the University of Oslo, spent a year in the lab of Giulio Tononi, who's the um, founder of the the creator of the integrated information theory of consciousness, one of the leading neuroscientific theories of consciousness. And she's been interpreting that theory in a Russell Eddington panpsychist framework. Luke Roloff, who I just mentioned, reflecting on um, whether split brain patients, reflection on these cases can help us understand panpsychism and have a more consonant view of the relationship between particle consciousness and systems level consciousness. So I think, you know, this is this is really what's going to uh, move things forward. It's not just writing philosophy papers, but getting involved with scientists and interdisciplinary work on really spelling out the details of, of the panpsychist framework and ultimately moving towards a really testable and coherent and plausible overall theory of consciousness. So that's that's, I think, what's most exciting to me at the moment. Great. Sorry, that's again Great. quite long-winded. I need, to, <laughs> well, I need to give shorter answers to questions. You're pretty busy, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good. Great. To be. Well, yeah, always. <laughs> Philip, I would really like to thank you for your participation in the podcast. Ah, thank you. It's been really enjoyable. It's been great chatting. Likewise. Thanks a lot. You have just listened to Premise Podcast. Subscribe to Premise Podcast on YouTube and make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter and Facebook. The podcast is also available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Please consider supporting Premise Podcast on Patreon to help bring philosophy to the public. See you next week. Thanks for listening.